further display to the glory of God. Thank you. We now have topical questions. Question one, Liam MacArthur. An officer to ask the Scottish Government for what reason it has abolished the Getting It Right for Every Child programme board. Minister Aileen Campbell. In order to develop our Getting It Right for Every Child policy, the Scottish Government established a programme board and a strategic implementation group. The board's role was to help shape the policy in relation to the drafting of parts four and five duties in the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, and I met 14 times from February to September 2014. The National Implementation Support Group has responsibility for oversight of implementation and continues to meet. We recently refreshed its membership to take us into the significant phase of implementation of the new statutory duties. Liam MacArthur. I thank the Minister for that response. As she says, the, the GURFIC programme board was set up to oversee the implementation of GURFIC and, according to the Scottish Government website, help drive improvements in outcomes for children and young people in Scotland by embedding the GURFIC approach across relevant services. At the weekend, um, the uh, Scottish Government uh, made clear to the press that the decision to abolish the pro programme board was a decision made at ministerial level to wind up the GURFIC board after May 2014. Does the Minister think it is acceptable for such a decision to be taken by Ministers without any apparent recourse uh, to the Scottish Parliament, which had responsibility for scrutinising and approving this legislation? Minister. Um, as I said uh, to the member, uh, the, uh, the, the, the programme board was established to, f to take us through the, the, the legislative phase of getting it right for every child. And I took a decision uh, after the Act was passed uh, to look at options for maintaining the strategic engagement and to drive forward the implementation of GERFEC. Now, the programme board's job was done. We got through that legislative phase. So the, strategic uh, decision that I took was to focus on implementation and that is why the NSIG group uh, is uh, there to provide that strategic engagement and to try to make sure that we drive forward the implementation of GERFEC. That was a decision that, saw, that got the consensus at the last meeting of the programme board in September uh, 2014 uh, to make but with recognition that we needed to make sure that we had the right people on that uh, group to make sure that we did drive forward the implementation of uh, getting it right for every child. So while the board did uh, wind down, there was continued emphasis on implementation and that was done through the National Implementation Support Group. Liam MacArthur. Uh, I'm grateful to the Minister for that further clarification, but um, if I could press her on the point uh, about when and how this Parliament was informed about a decision in relation to a programme board that this Parliament was responsible for setting up. It doesn't appear to have been uh, any uh, information, despite the fact that um, she says consult consultation took place with the programme board members, to keep this Parliament informed of a decision in which it had a very legitimate interest. Minister. Um, uh, again, I'll, I'll reiterate that we had gone through that phase of legislation and to maintain that um, strategic uh, engagement with the sector and agencies and other people as well, we decided, and I decided to uh, focus on the implementation, which is why the implementation support group continued. It had been part and sat under the programme board, but that was continuing to make sure that we could drive forward the GERFEC agenda. I can make sure that uh, the member is furnished with all the, uh, the details of, of the meetings, if he so wishes, uh, and to make sure that we uh, can have that clarity that he is seeking, but certainly uh, I am uh, determined to make sure that we get the implementation of this important legislation right. That's why our attention focused from the legislative uh, phase that the programme board was charged uh, with uh, towards implementation, which is why then we decided that we didn't need both uh, uh, organisations and we decided to uh, maintain our focus on implementation, which is the role of the NISG. Mr McCarthy, you want in again? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, in terms of the implementation, uh, looking at the minutes from the meeting in May 2014, one of the issues that was raised uh, then was by the uh, Assistant Chief Constable Malcolm Graham of Police Scotland, uh, who uh, raised concerns or raised issues sorry, surrounding ensuring high-risk children remained a focus. You'll recall that even amongst those of us who were prepared to accept the case for named person, uh, one of the key concerns that we had was th that we shouldn't see a diversion of, of attention and resources uh, away from those who have genuine welfare issues uh, to address the wider uh, concerns in relation to wellbeing issues. Can you perhaps update Parliament in terms of uh, what reassurances have been given to Police Scotland and other members of the programme and implementation boards uh, that there hasn't been uh, a redirection of focus away from those uh, high-risk children? 
The whole thrust of getting it right for every child, as we've learned from the Highland model, is it allows us to focus and to uh, be more strategic with our resources and to make sure that we're getting it right for those children who show that most uh, uh, that, that level of need and that require that additional support. So there is not any uh, uh, retracting back from our, our focus and trying to ensure that we do things better for a group of vulnerable children. Uh, but that is part of the whole GERFEC approach, is about getting it right for every child every time. And the GERFEC approach, with the name person there behind it, is about making sure that we do uh, just that and make sure that we can use our resources in a strategic way and that's an effective way and the Highland model shows uh, that that works. Uh, like I said, you know, at the last meeting that we had uh, in September of the programme board, the, there was consensus from the board members to wind down the board. I thanked everybody there for their input and for their efforts to get us through that legislative phase, but it, it was clear that we needed to turn our attention on implementation, the effective implementation of this important policy that's designed to make sure that our children get the best outcomes that they deserve. Again, I'll put those minutes, uh, make those minutes available. They'll be on the, the government's website uh, and also make sure that we give uh, members any reassurances that they want if they want to kind of get in touch with me or write to me or they want further briefing. We'll make sure that that's there. But there is no hiding uh, that this uh, is an important plank of government policy. We had a programme board that helpfully got us through that legislative phase. Our attention, I think, correctly is to about getting this absolutely right for children. That requires uh, adequate implementation. That is why our focus turned towards that implementation via this group uh, and all the people who are involved in that include Police Scotland and others who have uh, been contributing through our work through the programme board. So happy to share any information if the member so wishes, but certainly I think our thrust and our efforts and towards implementation are, are the correct ones. Well, Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is there not a case for getting it right for the public? The minutes that were published were very clear in telling us exactly what was going on. Now that that board is no longer in existence, uh, we're not in a position to know what is going on. So is it not time that the Scottish Government published all the information and advice that is being given to it about the implementation in GERFIC and name persons? Minister. And I understand that the, the member doesn't have share my uh, views on how the getting it right for every child approach uh, takes uh, goes forward. But I am absolutely committed to this policy. I know that it's the right thing to do for our children to make sure that we have much more coordinated and coherent approaches towards helping our, our children. And we'll also make sure that if there are any uh, if there's any information that the member requires, that we can look into that those queries. But I have uh, made clear that the programme board was there to fulfil a function, which was to steer us through the legislative phase. The implementation is where our focus is on and we'll make sure that we're driving that forward for the benefit of children. I understand that the, the member doesn't share those aspirations through that we set out through getting it right for every child, but it is the right approach to take. We are doing our best for children, making sure that we get it right for every child every time. And we are using our partners across the health authorities, across local authorities, police, across social work, across the care inspectorate, across many different uh, third sector organisations, working in partnership, working collaboratively to do our very best for children. And if the member uh, has any uh, uh, bones to pick with that, then you know, let her, she, can get, she can get in touch with me and we'll let her see any information that she so wishes. But I know that our approach is right. We've focused on the legislation. We're focusing now on implementation. And uh, I'm, I'm content that we are doing all we can in an open and transparent manner. Question two, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many farmers will not receive the 70% emergency common agricultural policy payment in December. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. The first tranche of direct payments will be paid to around a quarter of claimants and should start arriving in bank accounts before the end of the year. The majority of farmers should receive their initial payment in January, with all first instalments paid by the end of March. The balance of payments is due to be settled in April, and our decision, of course, to deliver payments in two instalments is similar to the situation in 2005 when the last reforms were introduced. Mr. Fraser. So can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response, but he will be aware, I'm sure, of the anger and dismay amongst the farming community as to the delays in these vital payments. In February, the Cabinet Secretary told the NFUS AGM that everything was on track for payments to be made in early December. This has not been delivered. This is an issue which is entirely the responsibility of the Scottish Government. The, the Cabinet Secretary cannot blame Brussels. He cannot blame Westminster. The buck stops with him and his department. So will he now make a proper apology to Scottish farmers who have been badly let down? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Myrtle Fraser, the vast majority of farmers I've spoken to are understanding, given that jointly with the industry we took the decision 
over what the policy should be in Scotland. And the agreement I had with the industry was these policies should be implemented in Scotland with the additional complexity that would bring with Scottish decisions over and above the already complexity we had from Europe if the policy outcome was right and even if we had to have later payments compared to the payment window uh, last year under the old system. Can I also gently remind Murdo Fraser that at least we're having £500 million worth of support to underpin agriculture that will be issued in the next few months. If his party, his Conservative Party, had their way, there would be no payments going to farmers in Scotland over the next few months, given the Conservative Party's policy is to get rid of pillar one of the common agricultural policy. And that's what they argued for. That's what they argued for during the negotiations in Brussels. So Murdo Fraser belies the sheer hypocrisy with his anger today, given that there would be no support for agriculture if his party was in charge. But we understand the challenge of cash flow for many farming businesses in Scotland. And that's why we are working flat out to maximise the number of farmers who can get the first payments and to get as much of the first payment uh, as possible. We have said we will pay a minimum of 70 per cent in the first instalment, with the second part being settled in April. Given where England was in 2005 when they changed from the historic basis of payment to area payments, and given we are implementing not only the reforms they had to go through in 2005, but the second set of reforms in Scotland, I think what we are doing is reasonable under very challenging and difficult circumstances. And many farmers I have spoken to understand that, even if Murdo Fraser does not. Well, you can tell that when the Cabinet Secretary is in trouble, when he starts blustering in the fashion that we've just heard over the last few minutes. The National Farmers Union of Scotland have uh, asked the Cabinet Secretary to commit to paying 90 per cent of CAP payments by mid-January. He's made it pretty clear in the course of his answer he's not prepared to do that. Will he now ask for parliamentary time to make a full statement to this chamber to explain in full the reasons for his decisions and to allow proper questions to be made to him? Minister, Cabinet Secretary. I have already said to the industry and indeed uh, colleagues that I will be bringing a statement to Parliament in December before we issue the letters to farmers giving the estimated value uh, of their payments. I have also said that we will continue to put every effort in to increase the level of the first payment. I have said a minimum of 70 per cent. If we can go above that, we will do for the first payment. But can I say that we cannot give the full payment or a higher level at the moment with the information we have because we cannot finalise the value of entitlements until we know the total number of er eligible hectares of both payment, basic payments and its greening element in each of the three payment regions we decided to implement in Scotland. That is why it is a bit more complex in Scotland. We agreed with the industry to have three levels of payment depending on the type of land in Scotland, three payment regions. We also introduced voluntary couple support schemes to support the sheep sector and the beef sector, schemes that were opposed by the UK Conservative Government initially before we persuaded them that in Scotland we have to deliver such schemes and they really have to listen to us. So against that backdrop, we will continue to work flat out because we recognise the cash flow problems facing farm farmers and crofters in this country and £500 million worth of support will make their way to these important businesses over the next few months. Tavis Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I hope the Minister would accept that what Croft has said to me last night is what payment they're going to get, uh, and that's now the uh, crucial issue as well as the uh, timing. Would he also accept that when the Government held its roadshow meetings, for example, in Shetland, uh, the officials present made it crystal clear to crofters that reseeded land and improved croft land would receive the higher payment level, in other words, for permanent grazing and not, uh, permanent grassland and not that of rough grazing. 523 areas of Shetland croft land will now receive the lower payment, and those crofters are now wondering what that assurance was about when they received it earlier this year. I wonder if you could enlighten me and the Parliament. Well, due to the fact this is a very radical reform uh, in Europe's common agricultural policy, I do accept that there are lessons that will have to be learnt. And as the first year is implemented, we have the ability under the policy to revisit uh, the payment regions uh, as we move forward, if, that, uh, if there's a case for doing that. But I should also say that moving from the historic basis of payment in Scotland to an area basis of payment will actually help many of the, the western parts of Scotland and hopefully many of the island communities uh, as well. So that will bring additional payment to the, the uplands in particular and hill farms uh, in many parts of Scotland. But it's a very radical reform we're going through. Uh, there is no doubt that this parliament, the industry, the Rural Affairs Committee will reflect in the first year of its implementation, as is happening in every other part of the UK and every other part of Europe uh, as we go through this very radical change in European agricultural policy. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that the NFUS 
in-house magazine acknowledges complexity was always going to increase the risk of payments coming later and admits the complexity stems from meeting the Commission's new rules, a limited Scottish budget and the NFUS's own demands for a three-region model, phase transition and coupled support. Could the Cabinet Secretary indicate to what extent factors out with the Scottish Government's control and their willingness to listen to the Union may have contributed to the delay in full payments being made? Cabinet well, I also note the comment of the Tenant Farmers Association who said that as stakeholders we have known all along there would be challenges for Scottish Government with regard to payment timings, as was the case when the single farm payment was introduced in 2005. But now that the payment schedule has been indicated, they can now remove many of the uncertainties. In terms of the reason for the complexities of the new common agricultural policy, it is because it is extremely difficult to fit European decisions into Scottish circumstances. We have got uplands, we have got lowlands, we have got sheep, we have got calf, cattle, we have got islands, we have got mainland, we have got areas, we have got severe weather problems and climatic conditions in Scotland and others that do not have quite severe conditions. So that is why we sat down with the industry and stakeholders and looked at how we could uh, mould the European policy to Scottish circumstances. And that is why, as I said before, in this country we agreed with the industry, even if the price was to delay payments by a month or two or whatever the timescale may have been, three different payment regions, unlike other parts of the UK, as well as implementing greening, as well as voluntary couple support schemes for sheep and cattle, and as well, of course, as the big radical reform of moving from paying on historic basis of activity to area of land you have. So I think, given all these ingredients, uh, we can understand why we have these complexities in Scotland uh, and these challenges. But the key point is we are getting there and £500 million worth of support that would have not been there if other people had got their way will be delivered to food production and Scottish agriculture. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us, given that he spent £180 million on his computer system, what proportion of the 21,000 single application forms have been successfully processed, how many farms are still to be inspected, and when individual farmers will know which category of payment they will be in so that they can budget accordingly given the financial crisis that is affecting many of them? Well, Sarah Boyack's right in that we have, uh, from memory, I think around 1,300 farms we have to inspect, and officials are working flat out to make their way, and they're making good headway through those inspections, which we have to carry out before we make payments to the farms uh, concerned. Uh, in terms of the £178 million business case for implementing the new common agricultural policy in Scotland, that's not just for the IT system and is over several years. It equates to 4% of the cap payments over the next uh, six years and hopefully the system will last a lot longer than six years. So we have to invest that resource as has happened uh, in other parts of the UK and other parts of Europe to deliver the complexities within the common agricultural policy. Uh, in terms of the applications we have to go through, as Sarah Boyack says, all the applications so we can get a degree of accuracy that allows us to pay out the payments. Because it's an area payment scheme, if you don't know all the entitlements and then you, you have to revisit, then you have to get refunds from many of the farmers who have already received their payments. That is why the wise and sensible thing to do is to pay out in two instalments, as has happened in 2005, with a minimum of 70% in the first payment uh, and the balance been settled uh, in April. So that is the background. Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would accept that it was the inadequacy of the uh, IT system that has currently cost uh, £10,000 per application that caused the whole process to be extended by a month, and it's that month's extension that has led to the delay in the entire rest of the process. If it hadn't been for that, payments could have been made on time in December, as has become the norm. Cabinet Secretary. I fully accept that things have not gone well with the IT system as compared to what they could have been, and that's a case facing all governments, and we've all got lessons to learn in terms of IT projects. But the reason why we gave a month's extension was because of the complexities of the new system to give the, the sector more time to submit their application forms. So the root of that issue, of course, again, was the complexity of the new policy. Otherwise, the IT would have been easier. It would have been a simpler policy. But it wasn't. It was a complex policy. Therefore, the IT issues arose. Uh, I have to say that the Conservative Party government south of the border, I think I read somewhere, has effectively dumped its IT system and using paper for the transition. And they're not even having to go through what we're going through. Uh, they're not even having to go through in Scotland uh, what they had to go through compared to what they did in 2005 as well as uh, this reform. 
The, the key point here is that we have to get the payments out. We're ma the IT system is now working, and we're working our way through the applications. The key point here is getting the £500 million out of support to Scottish farming businesses. We agreed with the industry. That takes a few weeks longer because of the complexities. As long as we get the policy right, that's what matters, and that's what we've done. Angus MacDonald. Let's not forget, President Officer, that farmers have been fortunate in receiving their payments in recent years in December rather than uh, later in the payment window up until the following June. And let's not forget we are where we are because of the more complex policy requested by farmers and crofters. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the economic impact of delayed payments will be modest, as has been uh, confirmed by the banks, and that most farms should have little difficulty securing bridging funding if necessary? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Angus McDonald is right, and of course, the payment window, which we've not mentioned and which people conveniently put aside, is from the 1st of December to the end of June. And that is a legislative payment window that we have. And we have a very good record in past years under the old system of getting the payments out as early as possible in the payment window. So clearly, people are comparing uh, our timetable with the new cap to the fantastic success we had in paying out the beginning of the payment window under the former policy. But in terms of the economic impact, uh, I have met the banks. The banks are comforted by the fact that they know that £500 million worth of support will be make, making its way uh, to the sector in the coming months. They do, of course, urge any farmer who has any issues to contact their bank as early as possible. And I do hope that's advice that all members can take back to their constituencies for those of us that represent rural and farming communities. Uh, and the banks will work with uh, their, their clients, uh, and that should give us all comfort. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move on 